Good morning. Welcome to Vineyard Milwaukee Church. We are so glad that you're with us this morning. If you're joining us online, hi. Hi, Mom. And Tammy. And Tammy and everybody else that's on there. We are, are excited to worship. It's a beautiful day to worship. Let's stand in this place and let's enjoy the presence of the Lord. Holy is 
your name.
are hungry. We are hungry. We are hungry. Oh Lord, we are hungry. We are hungry. We are hungry.
I don't know if I'm supposed to take this off or not, but I did, so hopefully that's okay. Yep. Uh, what's up, guys? Uh, what's up, worship people? I'm Riley. Uh, I'm just one of the people here. Uh, thank you for coming today. If you're here, thank you if you're watching online. I'll just start today with some announcements. Uh, first and foremost, today is Greg Wessel's 50th birthday. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dude. That's amazing. 50, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. No pressure for gifts. No pressure for gifts. It's just a big deal. That's all. Um, I realized I was singing happy birthday to the worship pastor. That's why I stopped on the microphone because that's what am I doing? Um, but just a couple announcements for today before we get started with Rebecca's message. This is the final reminder that this Saturday night there's a, a women's ministry and worship night at the Thrive Vineyard in Palatine, Illinois. Uh, which is about an hour and 20 minutes away. It's a free event, but you need to register using the link. Uh, it's in the newsletter, so check your email if you'd like to sign up. Uh, there is also a link to register for a carpool. So if you don't want to drive and you want to carpool with people, there is also a, a link for that where you can register for the people from here that are going down. Uh, just let us know if you plan to join with us uh, by Thursday so they can plan accordingly. Uh, if you've already registered a carpool, Rebecca will be reaching out and contacting you with details. Uh, finally, as a, continue, uh, as a continuation of worship of service here at the Vineyard, we do uh, get uh, tithes and offerings, receive them in several ways. Uh, one, you can text to give if you're savvy that way. Uh, you can also give online. Uh, you can set it up to where it repeatedly gives if you need to. If you're like me and you're forgetful about bills and you just hit the... Uh, Auto pay, that's also really helpful. Uh, and then if you're super old school, there is a black box in the back also. Uh, we just ask that you give as God has given generously to you. Um, if you're comfortable with it, uh, if you are taking the moment to pray over it, we just ask that you pray over it and uh, hear what God's going to do for you. Now, I am going to invite the real star of the show, Rebecca, up uh, to continue our uh, series on building bridges. get situated. <clears throat> so uh, many years ago now, Dave and I attended a conference um, in a place, in, it was in Urbana, Illinois, at the University of Illinois. So it was this huge missions conference. There were people from speakers and worship. There were thousands, I think, like close to 20,000 people there. It was a lot of young people, People came from all over, missionaries, all kinds of stuff. It was a really cool event. It went on for several days. But I really only remember there were like two moments um, in the whole conference that have just remained with me after all these years. And one of them was this, it was kind of one of the last speakers of the week. And this guy got up to speak. And what really stuck out to me is, was, was actually this experience of this guy losing his voice when he was speaking. So this guy came up to speak, and he was speaking about relativism, this kind of idea that kind of had been seeping its way into the church, um, that Jesus was just like a way to the Father or a, you know, possible um, pathway versus 
actually the Son of God and actually the way to the Father, the truth, the life. And so he was really speaking about this, and he got up there. He had no issues at all speaking. Um, he was speaking quite passionately, really into his message. But as he got deeper into the kind of the meat of his message, it was almost like laryngitis just suddenly struck him. I mean, prior to this, he had no cracks in his voice. He wasn't suffering from a cold. And then suddenly there's all these cracks in his voice. He's having trouble speaking. He's getting quieter and quieter. He almost got to the point where he could barely speak. And so at one point, a woman runs up and gives him a bottle of water, and he's drinking the water, and it's still not working. Eventually, she brings him a cough drop. Finally, she goes up there to give him something else, and everyone from the audience starts yelling, pray, pray. And so <clears throat> 20,000 of us stop and start praying for this guy. She lays her hand on him. And literally, instantly, his voice was fully restored. And he was able to finish completing his message. And so what really struck, why this stayed with me all these years is because it seemed that a power was coming against him. Like wanting to silence his message. And what was interesting is what, why would his words be so threatening? That an actual supernatural power would attempt to interfere with what he was trying to say. Because the truth is, when we are conveying the truth, we are conveying the love and the life found in Jesus with our words, those words carry power. Your words have power to not just transform someone's life, but actually transform multiple people's lives, right? When we influence one person, that one person has a sphere of influence. We can actually, our words can actually have the power to influence generations. And so they can carry enough power that actually rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms can attempt to silence them. I'm not going to assume that's what's happening right now. <laughs> Do I need to pause and let us, should I keep going or is this important that we figure this out? All right. All right. Let's, let's pray. Come Holy Spirit. I just ask that whatever you want to say today is, is said and recorded, whether people are in the room or at home, that, that they hear from you personally. So if you've been with us, for we've been talking about this idea of building bridges. So this idea of being building bridges of healing where you work, where you play, where you worship, in your family, everywhere you go, that we are actually bridges, right? We're bridges of heaven and earth. We carry eternity in our being. And one of the ways we do this is by being a witness to Jesus. And we do this with our lives. I talked about like being the bridge. We do this with our works, with good works, with ways we serve and love and bless our community. But today, I specifically want to talk about what does it mean to be a witness to Jesus with our words. So just to repeat, this is the third time we've used this scripture in Acts 1-7. Jesus, he's saying to his followers... After he's died and resurrected in the short period before he ascends to heaven, he says to them, uh, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we've been talking about what does it mean to be a witness. Now, if you, if you go just a little further in Acts, like after this moment, um, the Spirit, we're going to be talking about this in a few weeks, is poured out at Pentecost. And then Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit, and the first thing this fisherman does is he stands up and very boldly, in front of a huge crowd, begins to be a witness to who Jesus is with his words. That he was the actual anticipated Messiah that they all had heard about, that he actually was the Son of God, and that those listening could still turn to him. So look with me in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 37. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Then it says, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So 3,000 people's lives are transformed on the spot by the power of the Spirit expressed in Peter's words. Not to mention the 
the multitudes of people those 3,000 people would, would touch. And so what does it mean? As I said, we talked about being salt and light to the world. And many of us are open to that idea. We like the idea of being salt and light, of like spreading our kindness around, spreading our love around, serving and blessing people. And many of us are open to that idea that being the kind of person that embodies the kingdom. But a lot of us get a little squeamish when we think about using our words. So there's likely many reasons for that. But I want to highlight four of them, that as I was preparing this, and I think this especially speaks to those of us who grew up in the church or maybe really kind of like detangling from if we grew up in an evangelical church, things like that, and we're going through all this kind of stuff that we may have like been raised in places where we were taught like the four spiritual laws and how to go up to somebody in a mall and say, do you know where you're going to go when you die? And we may have all these like yucky experiences that have just created all this angst in us that we're like, Ugh, I don't even want to use my words because we have all these triggers in us. And so I just want to unpack kind of four obstacles that I think come up. They've come up for me. I think they often come up for us. And what I want to do hopefully is encourage you about some of these obstacles, but I'm also going to leave you with a little challenge for each of them. Okay, so I'm going to go through them quickly. So I got four of them. Um, the first one is that there will be interference. As I said in my opening story, there actually will be supernatural interference with you using words to convey something that is true and carries a lot of weight. These are people's lives, right? It carries a lot of spiritual power and weight. And so, as I said, you know, in the story, I talked about Peter getting up boldly and 3,000 people being added to their number. Uh, well, just shortly after that, we have our first martyr of the faith. If you are familiar with the Bible at all, this guy, Stephen, he gets stoned to death for talking about Jesus. And so, there is supernatural pushback. My guess is that none of us in America are going to get stoned to death for talking about Jesus. But... We are going to experience, like, different kinds of stones. They often will come in the shape of, the, of our enemies speaking lies over us. Like, you're such an idiot. You look like an idiot. You sound like an idiot. Everyone's going to reject you. Um, you're going to be seen as one of those kind of people that you do not want to be seen as, right? We're going to have all kinds of, like, junk in our head. And so my encouragement to you today uh, in 1 John 4, 4, it says, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And he's referring here to the discernment of spirits. He's basically saying the Holy Spirit is greater than any kind of supernatural force coming against you. So the, the voices that make us self-protect and make us insecure um, and make us feel small, and make us feel dumb, and all those voices, the Holy Spirit is greater than all of those forces coming against you. And so the fear you're experiencing is actually just lies. They're actually just lies coming at you. And so there may be initial pushback, but my experience is the minute I open my mouth and just take a risk and let anything come out, the Holy Spirit shows up so quickly that suddenly I... I'm having these experiences I can't even explain. I, like, feel the Holy Spirit. I feel joy. I feel peace. I sometimes feel almost jittery and excited. I remember the first time I, my, I can remember actually talking about Jesus with a friend. I was in, like, eighth or ninth grade, and I had gone on a, this little vacation with a friend of mine, Carla, and I think it was, like, between middle school and high school. We were just laying in bed one night chatting, and I don't remember how it happened, but we, and I ended up just, we start talking about our lives and talking about God and all sorts of things. And I just start sharing what I know about Jesus. And I, I didn't have the language or understanding of it then because later I was telling my parents about it. And I remember saying, my body got all kind of jittery and quaky and I felt all this stuff. I just thought it describes like adrenaline coming through me. But it was just the Holy Spirit. And I didn't really realize it at the time, but I was so nerdy. I don't even remember what I said. I remember singing, like, some kind of hymn to her, and, like, I don't even know. But she eventually gave her life to Jesus and is still following Jesus to this day. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure I was just one person on her journey. But it was, I just opened my mouth and started speaking. And I've had that experience so many times 
or I've been talking to neighbors and and just as I started sharing something that's just real to me, suddenly I feel the Holy Spirit in the space and I just feel like a, all the insecurities just seem to kind of go away. And it's almost like God's doing something and it's bigger than me and I'm just kind of there for the, for the show. So my uh, encouragement to you is that if you just open up your mouth, the Holy Spirit will meet you. Uh, number two, we feel unworthy. Many of us feel like we're struggling with our own faith. Like I said, we might be going through like a deconstruction experience. We may be struggling with our own commitment to Jesus. We may feel like, gosh, I don't even, I feel kind of like a fraud, like call myself a Christian, but I don't, I'm not really praying. I really don't know much about the Bible. I don't even know what I really believe right now. So we're kind of going through all this stuff. My life choices aren't really congruent with what I think I believe. Um, maybe you just feel like you're in a mixed up place and you feel like what? business do I have talking about Jesus when my own life is a hot mess? The truth is, the truth has power even if you're struggling to believe it yourself, even if you're not sure. If it's true, it's true, and it has power. And so the thing to remember is that God is at work in the other person's life. Like, this is not about you. He's, he's doing something in that person's life, too. And so, like I said at Easter, Jesus is king, whether he's your king or not, right? So if it's, if it's true, it's true. And so you can actually tell people about Jesus even when you feel far from him. You can just be really honest. Like, dude, I, I don't think I've prayed for like a year. I don't even know what I really believe. But I know at some point in my life, Jesus has helped me. I mean, I know he helps a lot of other people. I'm part of this community. I mean, this is what I know. You can check it out for yourself. I mean, you can just tell the truth. Sometimes we're more accessible that way when we're actually just really honest. We're like, I don't know where I am. I'm going through a lot of struggles right now. But I know at some point in my life, I think I still believe at least some of this is true. I mean, you just, you just speak what's your reality. And even if your faith is really small, in the midst of our hot mess, sometimes that speaks more to people. Because they're like, gosh, this person is going through all this stuff, but they still are holding on to something. This might be worth checking out. They're still holding on to this thing. So you can be really honest about your life, that you still believe God loves you, that you still cling to him when you're at the end of your rope, that maybe Jesus is worth exploring. And some of us, we, our lives might not be a hot mess, we might feel like we're doing our best to live with integrity with our works and our words and our lives. But due to like a spiritual stronghold or lies the enemy speaking over us, we might still feel like we're unworthy. So regardless of the reasons that we may feel that, uh, I, there, there's this great moment in, um, in Acts chapter 3 where John and Peter are walking along and there's this guy begging for money and... They just feel empowered by the Holy Spirit suddenly that God wants to do something in the moment. And so they just take a risk. And they're like, ah, dude, I don't have any money, but what I do have, I'm going to give to you. In the name of Jesus, stand up. And they pull this guy up. This guy was like lame from birth. So they literally have this miraculous healing on the spot. And everyone, of course, is amazed because everyone knew this guy grew up and suddenly he's healed. And it says in um, verse 12, when Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? In other words, I'm just available. The Holy Spirit did this. This isn't about my goodness. This isn't about me having a bunch of special powers. This just means I was available and God did this thing he wanted to do for this guy. So I stretched out my hand and joined God in what he wanted to do. But it was God's goodness. It was God's power that did it. So it doesn't matter how holy we are, how eloquent, how convincing, it will be the Holy Spirit that will transform someone's life. But we need to be available. Like the bridge, we need to be willing. They stretched out their arm. They were the bridge in that moment. They bridged heaven and earth for this guy who was lame from birth. So my challenge to you today is to be available. When the door opens, walk through it. Number three, we feel inadequate. Many of us don't feel smart enough. We don't feel articulate enough. We don't feel like we know the Bible well enough. 
We don't think we understand theological concepts well enough to really engage in conversation about faith. So we fear that someone will present an argument we can't defend or ask a question we can't answer. But the truth is God does not need defense attorneys. God's not insecure. We don't have to make arguments for God or prove God's existence. And honestly, most people are not intellectually argued into the kingdom. What most people are asking is, why am I here? What's the point of my life? What do I do about my difficult marriage? What do I do about my kid who is struggling? Or as Billie Eilish said it in, in her theme song for the Barbie movie, what was I made for? What's my purpose? You don't need to have all the answers. Some of them no one frankly has. You don't need to be able to explain the mystery of human suffering. I mean, no one can. <laughs> what people are dying to hear, though, is how life with Jesus is significant in your life. How life with Jesus helps your personal suffering in your difficult marriage, in your heartache over one of your kids struggling. They want to hear why you maintain hope in the midst of difficult circumstances. I remember years ago, uh, I had invited a work colleague to church with me, and afterwards we were hanging out in her backyard. It was an evening service around a fire, and her neighbor came over, and he heard that we'd gone to church together, and he had grown up in church but kind of walked away from faith and was kind of going through one of those, like, You know, when people are a little snarky and salty about stuff, kind of working through their stuff. So he was one of those kind of guys, and he liked to debate. And I like a good debate. So we were having all these discussions about the Bible and about truth and this and that. And we're going on and on. And finally, he goes, he says to me at one point, he goes, and and what about, he said, um, you know, the whole flood scene with Noah and all that. He said, do you know that, like, all the ancient civilizations have a whole flood myth in their narrative? And I had actually never heard that before. I later did learn about that when I went through the Vineyard Leadership Institute as actually an argument to prove the reality that the flood probably happened. Because if there was actually a huge flood, it would have shown up in about a a lot of ancient civilizations. It would have happened all over, and a lot of different civilizations would have written about it. It would have been part of their narrative. At the time, I didn't have that argument prepared, so he was using it to dismantle the idea of Noah and the flood. Anyway, he says this to me, and I'm hearing it for the first time, and I just said, I didn't know that. He's like, well, what do you think about that? And I'm like, I don't know. I've never heard that before. I, I, I I don't know. And he just got quiet, and he goes, wow. A Christian just saying, I don't know. That's refreshing. (laughs) It's okay not to know. It's okay not to know. It's okay just to be honest and be your truth. That actually opened the door for actually more meaningful conversation. Like I said, how does Jesus actually impact your real life? Not did the flood actually happen. There will always be people who have intellectual stumbling blocks, and there are tons of great resources by people a lot smarter than you and me who have, there's no new question under the sun. For 2,000 years, people have been thinking and writing about these difficult, challenging theological questions we all have. And there's great books out there. There's great podcasts. There's great, there's tons of information. If someone has a stumbling block, Just say, hey, I I don't have the answer, but if you really want to explore this, I'm happy to get resources for you. And there's plenty to get. But before anyone goes there, what is most compelling is how your relationship with Jesus actually impacts your real life. That's what's going to be compelling to people. I, I remember Dave and I had a couple over not too long ago who don't have life with God but are going through a lot of stuff with their older son. And we were just sitting around talking, and Dave just starts kind of sharing the story of the prodigal son. And I'm not quite sure, as Dave was sharing it, um, who the, the, like, whether this friend of ours was meant to be the father or the son or how, exactly how it all applied. Um, and I'm not sure if Dave knew where he was going with it. But all I know is as Dave's sharing the story, just tears are streaming down his face. Because something about the truth was coming out. 
and it was speaking to his own father's heart. And that's all we did, is just share some truth about the grace and love of God. So you should feel free to share what you know, regardless. And so, but I do want to add one little just challenge in here for you. Um, Even though you do not need to have all this biblical education or theology to be able to just share what you know and what you have, I do want to challenge you that if you are an apprentice of Jesus, and this matters to you, that biblical education and theological theology like does matter in our lives. Uh, We are called to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And so it is valuable to be tethered to 2,000 years of theological development within the church, Big C Church, across space and time. The church is universal. It's around the whole world. It's been around for 2,000-ish years. And so it does matter that we're part of this greater, like, history and community. And one of the reasons it's so important is because There will be times in our life where we're anxious, we're confused, we might be swept up into the latest, um, you know, new approach to faith or this new captivating blogger, this, like, great new idea that just emerged. And it's important that we remain grounded to a rich, deep, historical, theological movements of the Christian church. It's okay to examine and explore all those things, but without some grounding, we can just easily kind of get moved around into all kinds of spaces and ideas. And so uh, if you have no other education than just catching a few sermons once a month, I want to challenge you to consider integrating some biblical education to your life in some way. Um, there was actually a recent, the most recent podcast dropped by the We Are Vineyard podcast talked about this idea, and a book just came out called We Are the Theologians, and it was written for people like you and me who don't have tons of time on our hands to like read huge, thick books and try to get through all this theology and it just goes through like the major theologians that have influenced the Christian faith in really short, simple, accessible ways. Um, and also is interesting, one of the authors, Dr. Jennifer Bignett, also has a book call, coming out called The Mary We Forgot, What the Apostle to the Apostle Teaches the Church Today, which I thought I'd mention because I knew Joanna Love would want to check that out. Um, and so I, that's a book you could pick up. I would also recommend anything from the Bible Project, super accessible. Um, There are great podcasts, there are great blogs, there are videos. They're actually really well done, easy to follow, online seminary level classes you can take from Tim Mackey. I would recommend all of those. It's just simple ways to begin to integrate some good theology into your life. And finally, number four. One of the stumbling blocks I think we sometimes experience is we're not always sure we're sharing good news. And this was my story. And I think this can be a story for people who maybe grew up in the church. I just listened to this hilarious comedian recently. He talked about being raised as a Christian in the 80s. And he's like, so I got raised, he goes, I was raised by like the Christian Christians in the 80s. And it was just hilarious because it was like my story it was so funny, but uh, there was just, at least the, the, my experience growing up, there was such a huge focus on um, personal sin management and this fear of the afterlife and just so much that left you, left me, especially with my particular personality, and a lot of bondage and fear of condemnation and a lot of that needed to be untangled for me, not just theologically and intellectually, but in a very embodied way, in my whole being, before I freely could walk in a space of freedom with Jesus, where it felt like good news for me, so that I knew I was, that this was good news for everyone. No matter who you are, where you're coming from, that that, that Jesus and life with Jesus is good news for you. And so I remember actually, even not that long ago, even though it's been a huge journey through my adulthood, Even like about eight or nine years ago, I was sitting in a coffee shop listening to a speaker talking about how most people walk around with a sense of guilt and fear and insecurity and they feel like frauds and all this stuff. And he's describing just like humanity and I'm, I'm seeing, and that we're meant to like invite them into the freedom of Jesus where that can get that shame and 
fear off of them, and I'm listening to this going, but that's me. Like, that's how I feel. And I almost, like, I remember racing out of the coffee shop and, like, running down the lake to pray. I'm like, God, this is me. Like, I'm the one feeling the shame and condemnation and guilt. How am I supposed to invite other people into a party I don't want to be at? And so it began this deep journey through prayer and spiritual directors and working through the Ignatius exercises and powerful encounters of the Holy Spirit and just being loved into freedom, rescued into beauty, having that shame washed off of me, having that perfect love cast out the fear of condemnation before I recognized this is a real party. (laughs) This is a party I want to be at and I want everyone I know to be at because I've recognized this is joy. This is life. There's this um, great um, verse, I'm jumping way ahead here, where uh, Jesus is getting closer to the cross, and he's saying harder and harder things. Like, he's, he's really setting himself up, like, like, what it means to follow him and who he really is, and especially for the people at that time, it was requiring a lot of, for them. For, for what to follow Jesus. And so they were, they were all like, this is too much. You're getting too weird. You're talking about eating your flesh and drinking your blood. I'm out. So people started leaving. And it got down to just, you know, like a few. And Jesus said, are you going to leave me too? And I love what Peter says in response. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else are we going to go? Now that we know who you are, where else are we going to go? And that's what eventually happens. You're like, who else is there? Where else is there? You have the words of life. Have you found the words of life anywhere else? That's all you're telling people. Where else are you going to go? What else do you have? And so my challenge to you today is if you find, if, if, if this is your story, if, um, if you feel like you're struggling with a sense of guilt or bondage, that you might feel like you're inviting people into bondage rather than into life, then my encouragement to today and my challenge is to get free. <laughs> Don't stay in that prison cell. Decide that your personal spiritual freedom is worth your time, your money, your energy, You cannot heal yourself or save yourself, but you can make choices to open yourself up to the healer. And so I want to challenge you to find out why life with Jesus isn't something you would want to invite others into. Why is that? There's likely some part of you that experiences this good news. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here. But maybe there's still some unhealed parts that connect with shame or guilt or striving with your faith. And so something is, is keeping you from walking in the fullness of your freedom. And so typically, these kind of places of bondage are not healed up by adopting new ideas or new theology. It's something that God has to do in you. And so it's by surrendering to the deep, transformational, healing love of God. And this is a journey that you're invited into. And the process is grounded in intimacy with your creator, with your parents, with the one your soul longs for. As I said earlier, most people are interested in how your faith in Jesus impacts your real life, your relationships, your sense of purpose, your sense of self, and it's hard to give away what you don't have. And so if you're not experiencing Jesus as good news for yourself, that's leading you to more freedom and more healing, then stop settling. I'm not suggesting you work harder or start doing more things. I'm just inviting you to press in for more. There's more God has for you. I actually want to share a podcast with you um, because I think it actually speaks to this so much. I know not all of you will watch it, and it's, I know this is a podcast actually about the Enneagram, and I know there's lots of mixed views on this, but this is actually not about the Enneagram. If you listen to this, they barely talk about it. But it's from, I think I have a slide for it. No, no slide. Okay. I'll put it in the newsletter. All right. So it's from this, this podcast called Typology, 
Um, and they recently interviewed this guy named Christopher Cook who wrote a book, Healing What You Can't Erase, Transform Your Mental, Emotional, Spiritual Health from the Inside Out. So if you want to look it up, it's called Typology from this guy named Ian Cron, who's well known for the most popular book on the Enneagram, The Road Back to Me or The Road Back to You, I forget what it's called. Um, anyway, I, what I actually found more interesting was the, just the conversation they had about how healing happens. And it speaks to everything that I'm talking about right here. He does say a kind of a salty thing about some charismatic churches, which I found annoying, but it's toward the end. You can just not listen to that. But the rest of it's worth listening to. So I'll put it in this week's newsletter. I've not read the book. I'm not recommending the book. I just recommend listening to the conversation. It's all about becoming receptive to the healing love of God and surrendering to the spirit led process on this daily basis. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And so even if you feel fear, if you feel unworthy, if you feel inadequate or you feel shame, sharing the truth about who Jesus is and the life found in him with your words will have power by the spirit of God to transform people's lives. Power to welcome people into the grace and love of their creator. Power to offer hope in a world full of despair. Why don't, we, why don't we take communion together? If you're an apprentice of Jesus, I invite you to take communion with us. Um, we have an open communion table. We have communion elements here on the table. If you're in the aisles, someone from the table can bring you an element. This is what Jesus was inviting people into with his broken body and spilled blood. He was inviting them into freedom from shame and freedom from condemnation and into the restored heavens to experience eternity now, a taste of the future coming now. And so the night before Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body given to you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. And after supper, he took the cup, and as he poured out the wine, he said, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins, poured out for a new covenant of freedom. Let's take the cup together. So, Lord, we just receive in our beings right now you. <laughs> we ask right now that you'd fill us with boldness and courage, that you'd fill us with freedom that you'd wash away all those places in us Lord where we feel inadequate or unworthy or still held in bondage in some way and Lord we ask for a fresh filling of your grace right now of your love And Lord, just for the words of life, of everlasting life, just fill us with the words of truth. And God, just set us free, Lord, to walk in freedom, to give away what we have. And Lord, I just pray that you would do the deep and full and complete work of healing within us by your love. I pray just that you, we continually hunger and thirst for more of you, more intimacy with you, Lord, more union, union with you, God. I thank you, God, for doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves, for rescuing us, for saving us, for loving us, loving us into fullness, Lord, loving us home. We thank you, God. We honor you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, as we move back into a time of worship, um, the, the, the one piece about that podcast, why I recommended it, is one piece that was really speaking to me was, you know, this attempt we, we make at saving ourselves, of healing ourselves, of um, the whole message of Jesus is he, that he did for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And so I just want to invite you today, whatever that is for you, if you're like, 
I do have this place of bondage in me, or I have this physical thing attacking my body, or I do, I have this struggle with one of my children or in this relationship, whatever it is, whatever our current thing is that we just can't do for ourselves, I want you to come back and receive prayer and we just will intercede along with you that God would meet you in that place, that he continue to do for you what you can't do for yourself. And so whatever that is for you today, and I guess the other thing I just want to invite you to is if you feel like you maybe have some kind of trigger or stumbling block about ever just sharing your life with Jesus with your words, but you would like just for some open doors for opportunities to do that so you can experience that in a new way that's that's life-giving where you're not like, uh, how am I supposed to say this or what's the right thing, but you can just be yourself and feel more freed up in that way that you might come get prayer for that as well. If there's anything else you'd like prayer for today, there'll be people to my left, your right, that would love to pray for you.
us now with your mighty power. Please forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Pour your spirit out, let it rain. Come and saturate us. This is um, the last few chapters. This is the very end of Dark Night of the Soul by uh, St. John of the Cross. Um, the thick darkness that has deprived it all, this, yet love, faith, and now burning within, drawing the heart towards the beloved, influence and guide it, and to make it fly upward to God, along the road of solitude, while it knows neither how nor by what it means that it is done. Some of us may feel, or somebody potentially may feel like they have come into a place of darkness in their spiritual journey, a plateau, and everything just seems like ash, feels um, very numb and very closed off, and uh, you feel like maybe you're experiencing this place of solitude, uh, aloneness in your spiritual walk, in your journey, and the Lord is saying, I think, to you, uh, you're, you're being prepared to have your heart opened up to a deeper beloved relationship with God, like a marriage relationship to God. And if that touches you at all, um, if you feel like you've been, uh, been in a kind of like a, a deprivation tank of, of all of your, uh, everything that would make you typically feel happy or joyful or, or to give you some sort of response uh, in your heart um, and it doesn't work anymore. I think the Lord wants to open up your heart again in a way that um, he wants to become your beloved and that he wants to become uh, that place where you um, uh, nurture and, and drink from relationship through. Um, and so if that speaks to you, I want to pray for you.
I just thank you um, for the beauty and goodness of your kingdom and that it's here and it's at work and we just um, thank you for allowing us to come to your party and be part of it and so Lord I just pray that you would fill us with your spirit and um, show us places where we can stretch out our hands and open our mouths and join you in what you're doing and it's just establishing your reign and rule of love and justice and beauty and abundance here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. Have a great week. Go in peace. Greg, blessings and favor on your year. I pray you get a nap today or a steak or a great beer, whatever you need. Bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello.